All right. Special Barbarian Hour here, postseason. We have the top youth coach in Ohio for the West Shore. What is West Shore's mascot, guy? No, we don't have one. <laughs> it's like a Tasmanian devil old school, right? Yeah, the old school is a Tasmanian devil, but we kind of got away from that. But you guys, um, the, the top youth club in the state of Ohio, one of the best youth clubs uh, in the United States of America. And I speak from actual data and results. And you have the OEC titles back there in the background. And you're also the owner of Defense Soap. Also in the background, so we got a pretty nice backdrop for the uh, the Barbarian Hour here with Guy Seiko, uh, Defense Soap, and Re uh, West Shore Wrestling. So, first things first, how did I, I saw you OAC Junior High State? Um, it felt like you guys um, didn't you weren't having the year you normally have there. What what happened for you guys at OAC Junior High State this year? To start off, no, uh, we we still won our state title, but we won it in the division. We like to win the overall. You know, with all the clubs and everything, with Palmers in there and Burnett's in there and, you know, that. We didn't win the overall. I think we came in third overall. Um, but for, you know, our division, we won that, the school division that we're in. Is it one of those in that, is it one of those trophies back there that I'm looking at? Yeah, it's one of them. It, it's kind of bittersweet. I mean, we, we didn't have the guns that we had. We had a lot of kids out. Um, because they're going up or staying back or whatever. Um, so we didn't have a lot of hammers in there. But I tell you, I had, um, I think it was six sixth graders down there. I think we had maybe 20 kids total. Every single kid won at least two matches. Every single kid. And that's how you win state titles. You know, you, when I talk to, you know, John Heffernan, obviously your son Gus is John's number one assistant at St. Edward. Um, when I talk to John, I think the thing he's most proud of about St. Edward wrestling, which you guys feed, um, is the consistency. And if there's something I notice about West shore wrestling, it's consistency. Are you proud of that consistency as, uh, as well? What a guy. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we, we have a, a game plan that we pretty much stick to. Obviously we tweak it when we get different types of kids in the room. You know, sometimes you're really young and you have to make kids tough. Sometimes you have a really mature group and you can really hone in on, you know, a higher level technique, but the overall message is consistent. And we do this, we do the same thing over and over again. It just depends on what group of kids we're working with. The practice I came in for West Shore, you know, it's hosted at St. Edward and um, the practice that I came in for, man, so intense, the amount of high level coaches in there, high level dads, I didn't know Jesse Dunholm brought his kids there. I know, remember Jesse Dunholm. He was a state gym for uh, Akron Springfield. You know, that would just be an example. I couldn't believe it. I was like, man, he's a dad that's there, right? Jesse yeah, understands yeah. the sport of wrestling, right? Yeah. Division yeah. one college wrestler just comes floating in the room and, hey, can I join you guys? You know, it's it's kind of like, you know, the old birds of the feather. You know, we all we all have, I think we have an excess of 12 division one college wrestlers in the room right now. And we all have this in order to get to that level, you know, you all have kind of the same train of thought. I mean, there's a couple of wacky ones out there, you know, but we all have the same mission and it's just get these kids better. And when you have that many talented guys willing to sacrifice time, money, um, experience with, with these kids, share experience with these kids, it's just a winning formula. Uh, Coach Leonard ran the practice when I was in there. He's a really good guy at running rooms. Um, I think he understands how to push kids, when to get off, you know, come, you know, let off kids, I think is what kind of what I noticed. But I really liked how he ran it. Coach Augustino, Charlie, he was wrestling. Um, it was just awesome to see what you guys do um, at West Shore. And all the video I shot, I got a lot of feedback. It was just, how do you beat those guys? I think the biggest thing was, how do you beat West Shore? Because it's you guys are just like a, a well-oiled machine, right? And I think to beat you guys, you need this whole community buy-in by someone. And I don't know if I just don't know if anybody can do it in Division One in Ohio to get the buy-in. What you guys do? How do you get such a great buy-in at West Shore? Well, I, I learned a long time ago from Coach Finacci: you can never compromise your dignity when you're coaching. If you have a set of rules, those are the rules. You stick by them. You do not bend them for anything. 
Um, that's important because once you start bending rules and making exceptions for people, then then you start to get you know little fractures in your organization. We 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 will never do that. We always you know stick to the game plan, stick to the rules. Same rules for everybody. If my son is on the wrong end of the rule, well, that's just too bad. He's on the wrong end of the rule. I'm not going to change um, anything that we do to get anybody in the lineup. Um, it, and it's just doing the right thing. You do the right thing. You take all the egos out. You know, we're, we're very, uh, we don't have a lot of egos there. I mean, how do you get that many guys in a room and work together as a machine? You know, you, you have to remove the egos. And, and, and we do that. You know, we actually highlight our own personal failures and that's how we teach the kids you know it's you know if you're a national champion that's awesome but you don't have the same messages as the same guy who had to crawl his way back through the you know consolation bracket to get on the podium somewhere and you know we have a lot of that type of experience in the room that we can share with the kids it's really cool um so you guys won your division in the junior high guy and how did things go for you guys in the grade school OAC state championships in Ohio in 2023? We won the overall. We won our division and the overall. The, you know, it's always good to win the overall. It's just there's nobody in state anywhere, any combination of kids that can beat you. That's important. Um, and if you don't have the horses like I did in junior high this year, you, you can still win your division. You know, that's and it's nothing to be ashamed of to win your division. We won the division one, you know, high school division. So that's how they break it up. What what school you're going to go to, and and we won that, and and we we weren't that far from winning the overall thing, but but we didn't. You know, we just won our division. What's really what was what I really like and like to talk about is you know people like to say that you know Saint Ed's recruits, you know, and and they just recruit these kids, and that's why they steal kids away. Um, you know, I'm not a Saint Ed's guy. You know that I'm a Wellington guy. I just believe what that school does for kids. And I end up coaching that club that ended up there. Uh, and I've seen what it's done over the years. What I'm really proud of though, I, I put these trophies there, it's kind of a joke, but in the last um, three years, there there's a total of 24 state titles available between, you know, grade school, junior high and high school. You have the high school state championship and the dual meet. You have, um, eighth grade state championship, you have the eighth grade, I mean, junior high state championship, junior high, dual meet, and then you have something called divisional states. All right. And then grade school, you have the same three. In the last three years, St. Ed's and West Shore have won 23 of the 24 possible state titles. We took second in grade school state um, duels last year to Paris Graham, and they had that really nice class that they held back, but we beat them in the state tournament this year in junior high so we avenged that with uh with those kids so what i'm getting at is we don't recruit we might recruit kids into the west shore club when they're little but those kids then go on to saint as the russell um people just aren't aware of of the infrastructure that we have there and, and they like hey where did this kid come from where did that kid come from he's been in the room for the last 10 years working like hell to get into the saint as lineup and then when his time comes he's in the lineup they're like oh there's another one well that kid's put his time in um, a guy like Timar, we, I mean, you're, you're aware who Timar was, but Timar was a green team kid last year, state champion this year, same, same road Gus took and like people like, where do these kids come from? Uh, they come from, they come from 10 years, 14 years in that room. Some of those kids before they move on to college. And, and, you know, that's what I'm proud of that those kids come in, they stay there, they work through, they succeed, they get a great education at St. Ed's and they go on to whatever college they want to go to, you know, that's what it's all about. We have six kids in Ivy League schools right now. We have 13 kids wrestling division one college wrestling someplace, six in the Ivy Leagues. What other club in Ohio can say that? You know, that's 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 the kind of stuff that makes us proud. These these trophies here are just a reminder um, that, you know, it starts when they're little and they continue all the way through. Um, no magic, no, no shenanigans. We win them when they're little, we win them in their middle, and we win it when they're big. You know, you have Max Seiko, your son. First off, how did Max do this year at OAC Junior High st or Grade School State Championships? He won a second one. He won it in his one back to back. So he was young this year in the division. He outscored his opponents sixty three to two. He had a pretty good. He had a pretty good tournament. Um, his toughest 
his toughest match, I believe, it was uh, his own teammate in the semis, Dominic Rocco, solid, solid kid. Um, and, and that, but that's what that's what West Shore is. I mean, we have guys wrestling the semis at a state tournament. We were wishing it would have been the finals, but we have guys in the semis. We had another guy in the bracket that lost to the champion, or not the champion, the runner up, and in overtime, you know, so that pretty we're represented pretty well in these brackets, you know. So obviously Gus got Gus was they didn't have that they had the OAC, right? They didn't have the grade school, they had the junior high, right? With Gus, yeah, um, Gus was the, the the year I had that killer team with the Julius and Mitch and Habit and Gus and they they were all I think fifth graders and that was the first year that the OAC had grade school. I think Gus was the very first seventy five pound OAC state champion. He keep he beat Cam Desari in the finals. I f- listen, when you say something and then you just dropped all the names you dropped, Dave Habit is a father of three kids. Going to be a head coach moving from Western Reserve to, I mean, I, I'm i sure you saw where he's going, right? Oh, I love it because, you know, the Highland, they can't lick us, so they join us. They brought a West Shore guy in the runner program. I love it. But when you say that, I feel so old. Because I remember Dave coming up, coming out to Burnett's, and I remember Dave, obviously, he's a St. Ignatius guy. I remember covering him in, in, in elementary school, high school college and then obviously when he uh, wrestled the world championships in 2015 um for slovenia and i just now he's a father of three moving on to his second head coaching job and i like i feel so old and, and you're and you're, what are you an 86 grad high school guy 85 85 grad high school i'm a 98 grad high school right so if i i feel like that how do you feel well yes yeah, I'm, I'm on second generation some of these kids uh, but it, you know Another thing I learned from Coach Minacci, you have to know when your time to go is. And, you know, you don't want to be that old guy hanging around the room, dragging a program down. And I, I have my, my um, you know, future planned out. I, I plan on moving on out, moving up, retiring, actually, when Gus or Max hits high school. So I got four more years there. Right now, I mean, we're, we've been seeking a replacement for me for, you know, you know, we did that last year. We're looking, but we're on to some good guys that are going to, you know, possibly take over the reins. Um, we're running Eagle Eagle Club right now. Um, but it, it's a big, it's a big responsibility to take that club over. You know, like I said, I'm the fourth coach in 56 years of that program. So we got to find somebody that willing to do that seven days a week. You know, your entire your entire winter from November 1st until OAC every single day is West Shore wrestling. You know, there's not a day off ever. Except for Christmas, Thanksgiving, maybe. You know, we, we talk about that, and it's probably going to have to be someone who owns their own business is able is able to make their own schedule, and has a, a person who probably doesn't have like a employer per se, right? And has to be wealthy to a degree, right? Because you put a lot of money into it. I, I do, but there's some lot of exciting names um, circulating around the program right now. Yoshi Nakamura has a little boy that's going to start wrestling very soon. Sean Nemec has a little boy that was in the beginner program this year. Those are two great guys to have on your staff if you're running the program. You could really build something out of that. And those are just two. I mean, they, 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 they just keep coming back. You know, it's like they don't – they just keep coming back. You guys almost like – like you said, if people want to accuse St. Edward of recruiting, it's almost like I think the results speak for themselves. And it's almost like you're a magnet. Does that make sense to you? Well, yeah, I, I do have an advantage with coaching the youth program. Um, I get kids that eventually want to go to St. Ed's. So they love wrestling. I, I, I'm not, I don't have to go down to the gym class and look for five athletic kids and say, hey, come on, guys, we're, you guys are going to be wrestlers. I mean, I, I realize that that's a challenge that most coaches have in Ohio, right? I don't have that. I don't have that challenge. I, I get kids that, Eventually, you want to wrestle St. Ed's. There's, I mean, we have our own feeder program where we bring the little ones up. You know, I mean, our own beginner program we bring the little ones up. But that's that's about half of what ends up there. The other half are kids that start to get success and and want to go to St. Ed's, so they they come over and join us. Um, you know, there's guys that uh, that really like jumped out at me at the state tournament. Um, the Brown, the Browns, the Brown 
But they're brothers, right? Yeah. The Katie. Brown brothers are killers, man. And and they grew into that. I mean, they weren't always killers. They were pretty tough kids growing up. But I mean, they just they just did, had a really great high school tournament. I mean, they 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 turned it on. They they grew though. They had growing pains going growing up there. But they're doing really good. I mean, they're pinners. Every time I looked around, they were pinning someone. Well, Carson especially has been super tough for a while, but he was kind of under the radar. And he beat some really good kids. I mean, I remember watching him beat Gray Burnett up in um, Michigan at that what's, – what's Rogers tournament, Michigan State tournament in the beginning of the year. I remember um, – I mean, I know what he's talking about. Is it a my ago. way one? No, no. It, it's their kickoff one that they have up there. But, but um, I mean, anytime you beat Gray Burnett anywhere in his career, that's a significant win, you know. And they were a little – they were younger then, but – that's how tough Carson Brown was. He was able to beat Gray Burnett in that tournament. And and I, I think Gray's kind of like a a kid that that's that's a kid that you use as a measuring stick or you you compare other kids to because he's a pinnacle right now, you know. Yeah, Gray Burnett is the standard of of elementary and junior high wrestling in the state of Ohio for the last 10 years, basically. Yeah, he was number nine, right? He was a ninth three timer and yeah, and then Easter was 10, which is which is crazy. People ask me a lot. Um, do you think Ohio wrestling's getting weaker or whatever? And I, I looked at the junior high tournament this year, and we had two three time state champions. We've only had nine in the history of the entire tournament, yeah. or eight, eight up until now. But and we had two this year. So to that point, though, when you say that our depth is not what it was across the three divisions, division one's depth is still there, guy, but division two and division three's depth is not what it nearly used to be. So I understand where they're coming from with that. But you also do make a great point with our high end is still super high end. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. Cool. I mean, it's crazy to think about it. You know, Feaster and and Gray, like you said, um, you know, and Gray's the standard. You know, you're always chasing him. How about he had a rematch with the uh, Trukovic kid? And it was, remember the match when they were six-year-olds? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just wild to see. The OAC just does a fabulous job because it's all one division, right? The OAC – I mean, and that's one of your partners, you know, you're there, you know, Hey, everywhere I go, OEC, right. Everywhere I go, yeah. OEC, it's one of your partners. How do you think OEC does such a great job of putting the tournaments together and how do they draw the kids that they draw? Well, they, they kind of don't want to speak for them, but they kind of have our philosophy. They don't compromise their integrity ever. This is the way it's going to be. This is the tournament and, and they, and they do things the right way. They're very easy to partner with because we have the same the same train of thought. Let's do what's best for wrestling in Ohio. And when you take out all the other stuff and you boil down to what's best for wrestling in Ohio, um, that, that's what they do. And the, the touch on that junior high state championship, I tell people all the time, if you're a junior high state champion in Ohio, that's a real deal. These kids are one division. I know it's three years as opposed to four years in high school. But I think with that one division that makes up for that extra year, um, I, I believe it's just as tough, if not tougher, than Ohio High School State Championship, the, the junior high state championship. Did Gus, he won the, the grade school, right? He was the first champ at 75 pounds. Did Gus win, how many OAC junior high titles did he win? Because he was in he was in a golden era. He was in with Stevers, Tassari, yeah. David Taylor, Dave Habit. He was in a golden era. Did he win the OAC Junior High State Championships? Yeah, he won it one year. Um, the one his his sophomore year though was a crazy year in that bracket. You had like Tassari, Mitch, to Julius, Hunter Stever, um, <laughs> Gus. There there was like 17 state titles in the top six placers in that tournament. Wasn't Jamie there Cole. like Jerome Robinson and like Sam White? They were all in like everybody was clustered into like three weight classes, weren't they? Yeah, that was really tough back then. You had Felipe Martinez around then. Yes. Um, it, it was, that was, I mean, yeah, and Gus did good. He beat all of them except for Logan. He never beat Logan. He's beaten Clark. He's beaten Hunter. He's beaten, you know, the rest of them. Uh, but that's a little kid wrestling. It doesn't really count too much anymore, right? You know what's crazy about Logan Stieber? Logan Stieber, for, he's a whole generation of wrestlers like a 10 year period of wrestlers is molded 
and almost like around and built around like Logan Steber, like that group I just named, every name I just mentioned, right? He used to smash my nephew, Ian. He used to smash everyone. He would smash Johnny to Julius, Ty, Mitch. He was, he was just the hammer and they were all the nails, but those guys are all hammers, right? Smash everybody. The only, buddy, the only one was David Taylor. David yeah, yeah Taylor. there you go. Smash him in there a little. Yeah, um, it's crazy though, right? To think about it, like even David Taylor, when they were coming up, Logan was still better at age group stuff, right? Yeah, but yeah, it's when whenever Logan got beat when he was little, it was David Taylor. That was about it. Yeah. Well, here's wild. Think about this. Is wild. Who won a world title first? Logan Steber won a world title in 2016 in one of the toughest weights to win a world title in. It was the Olympic year, but or it was 2016. But they did the 60, whatever it was, 60 kilos or 61. I forget which one it was. But the, the weight he had to go through, his his all of his matches, the finals was almost his easiest match. But right. that world title that, that Logan won was as hard to win as an Olympic title. There's no question. But he beat David to winning a, uh, a, a you know, world title. And it was a real world title, you know. Um, his body just gave up on him. You know what I mean? Oh, it's brutal. I mean, that that level, first of all, they're Big Ten guys. You know, Big Ten is brutal. I, I have this conversation quite often. I, I love the competition in the Big Ten, but that's a rough season. You know, I like I like the ACC or, you know, where you could, you know, you could go wrestle Cliff Keen. You could go wrestle the Midlands. You could go wrestle the Southern Scuffle, but you could also grab a, a different school on the weekend for a dual meet. I mean, those Big Ten guys get no break. And, yeah. and I understand. I understand um why they why they feel that's honorable and you know they're always the toughest but that takes a toll on you you, you start yeah to, you start to see other people winning national champions and getting on that podium other than big 10 guys but there's no no arguing big 10 is the toughest obviously oh, oh there, yeah <laughs> we're not we're not debating i'm not i don't want to have that debate because it's not really a debate um why is john hoffernan such a great coach and and why do you think Gus can be the next. Well, how can Gus follow him up if Gus can follow him up? Why do you think Gus can follow him up? And why why is John Heffernan such a great high school wrestling coach? Because John has John has a system, but John has the same um benefits I do. He has kids that want to wrestle for St. Ed's, you know, and and they come through a program that's focused toward wrestling at St. Ed's and, and he gets the cream of the crop of Ohio. He has to develop them further, and he has a good system at doing that, and, and that's that's what he does. He's very good. He just won the coach of the coach of the year for Northeast Ohio or whatever whatever it was. Um, Gus believes in Heffernan's system. I think Gus probably believes in Heffernan's system more than he believes in mine. There's not great communication between West Shore and St. Ed's. And I don't, a lot of people don't know that. Um, it's it's two different organizations. One of them is you know a, a a kids program that wants to be St. Ed's and the other one is St. Ed's. So it's, it, it's two different things. Um, we, most of my guys wrestle for St. Ed's or, or they're, you know, like I said, division one guys. So they understand what, what it takes to get to that level. We push them that way. He takes them and develop them. Gus is not a good little kid coach. He has no patience. He's not good at that. He's good at developing higher level kids. Um, and that's the benefit that we have. We have, I'm a good little kid coach. I'm not a high school coach. I'm not a, my college coaching years are done back in the nineties, you know? So I'm not a college coach, I'm not a high school coach. I'm a little kid coach. It takes a, it takes a certain person to be able to do that as well. And it, it takes organization. Our guys are little kid coaches. We develop little kids. High school develops high school kids. There's no mingling, mingling between the two. Biggest thing that you think um, what West Shore does, you know, you talk about there's not the there's not this, but one hand does wash the other. You're yeah. developing guys, then you're handing them off, right? Exactly. You say that you don't have this great communication, but your 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 warehouse manager and the future owner of the company is with you every day for eight to ten hours. Well, another thing people don't realize is every single morning during the season we have an hour meeting talking West Shore wrestling. What kid needs what? What needs to be developed? What needs to be fixed? I, and there's three of us in that meeting every single morning to, having that conversation. Um, so 
it's not like we just roll out the mats and run around and, you know, and show a half Nelson. That's not what we do at all. You know, it's a little different here. Um, ultimately, you know, you say you got four more years of this. At what point do you panic and like, I got to have someone to replace me so I can go follow Max around as a St. Edward Eagle if he makes the team right, right away. But what point is is the is the the, the sense of urgency come? Um, I I'll, I'm not gonna have a sense of urgency because I've been I I put myself on a five year plan to get it done, and I I didn't just didn't just say hey I need to find a coach. I I went to one guy already. I didn't think I was hoping it might be right job. He right guy for a job. He wasn't. Um, now I'm on to my next group of guys, and I I think. There's a little bit of synergy there. People understand. Um, understand they came through the program. They're West Shore guys. So that makes it a little easier, you know. Um, with the name image likeness, right? Um, how many West Shore guys were you able to do business with, with name image likeness, with defense soap? who are West Shore guys, who are D1, D2, whatever guys. How many guys are on your, I guess, na- your, your roster for name, image, likeness for defense soap? Well, every one of them. Um, all 13 of my guys in Division I college wrestling are NIL athletes for us. And it's not money. I mean, we support them other ways, you know. Obviously, we give them soap. But um, they're, they're all our guys. We did not go to – I don't think we have one – the first round was all our guys, and, and they continue. I it, it wasn't until the second year of NIL that we let anybody else in on the defense soap wagon. We we reserved it specifically for West Shore St. Ed's kids, and they got the gear. They got you know they got the to use the name, but nobody else did that first year. And then I think Charlie since then has picked up a couple, couple other guys, but we're very selective. Do you feel like that's something where you guys? We'll start having athletes guy, or is there really no return for you? It's almost like you're paying forward it forward to them. What where do you go in the name image likeness as far as getting athletes to to be defense soap athletes? We don't really pursue it. Um we have we get we get approached all the time to um you know sponsor athletes, NIL, however you want to say it. Um Charlie has a set of standards that he goes by. If you don't fit the set of standards, then the answer is no. Um, and, and it's not that, it's not that, uh, we're not generous because we're, we are generous. It's just certain things that there's certain categories that you got to protect. And, and if you just give NI out to everybody, then, then it doesn't really mean so much anymore. So Charlie has a set of standards. They all go through him and he'll, he'll make a decision and come to me and ask me about it. Um, you could pick the wrong guy. I mean, there's, there's another apparel company out west that picked, you know, a certain Oklahoma State guy as their NAL guy, invested a lot of money in that. And boy, what a mistake that was. You know, so you really and that same guy has approached us, wanted fifty thousand dollars. We're like, we just laughed at him. We're like, no. <laughs> How do you handle that? How do you handle that when someone comes in through the front door, starts demanding stuff? And it and they don't know who you are. Clearly, they don't know anything about you because that's not how you handle guys, Seiko. How do you handle that? Yeah, we just say no. There, there's, there's certain. I mean, obviously, my guys always get taken care of, and that, and that's part of the power of, you know, West Shore and saying that too. The brotherhood lasts a lifetime. Um, and obviously, when these guys bring their kids back to me, they, they under, you know, they understand what we did and why they're a part of it, and they come back and they bring their kids and they want their kids to be a part of it. Um, but we always take care of our kids. Our kids, um are always a yes, you know, always. And we get great feedback from them. But I mean, we're kind of wrestling snobs here, not to be, not to be um arrogant, but my coaching staff has been around. They understand wrestling. They know wrestling. You're not you'd be surprised how many people send me, they want me to sponsor their seven-year-old kid. He took third place in the district championships and he's gonna be a state champion one day. You need to sponsor us so we could fulfill our dreams. I'm thinking. I was a policeman, you know, coaching a program. I couldn't even afford a, a hotel room sleeping in my truck. I'm not going to sponsor your seven-year-old kid because you think he's going to be a, a district champion next year. It's not going to happen. 
you know, but we get that all the time. Jiu-jitsu is a hundred times worse than wrestling, but we get that all the time. Okay. I just saw a new sticker. You guys are always doing constantly with your branding and you're, you're kind of branching out. You always test the waters, whether it's products, whether it's, and you know, the two big markets, obviously it's combat sports, right? Um, wrestling is your number one. It's your love. It's your, it's your bread and butter. It's your base, right? But Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, right? It's a very different community. Very right? different. Why is it so different? What's what's so different about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu compared to wrestling? Well, one thing first, they envy wrestlers. They they envy wrestlers like crazy. They don't always admit it, but when you sit down and talk to them, they the what they don't have though is they don't have the organization that they don't have a school program. Think about it. We start training wrestlers in kindergarten, second grade. They go all the way through. Then, you know, they go to high school, then they go to college, and they're very tough by the time they get out of college. You have some kids, you know, monkeying around in jujitsu, but you go to a jujitsu tournament, there might be one kid in this bracket and one kid in this bracket and two more kids in the division above, and they combine them all. You know, you go to Reno, there's 60 kids in your bracket. Big difference. Organized through schools and clubs. Jujitsu does not have that organization yet. Um, The clubs and the um academies do a great job but they don't have school programs pumping out jujitsu athletes so obviously the school relationship to schools and even physical education right they're not doing physical edu- they'll do they'll do a wrestling unit in physical education still right today they're not yeah. doing brazilian jiu-jitsu physical education units right and the other thing is how many jujitsu scholarships have you seen i've never seen one yeah so i mean that it it's and I'm not ripping on jujitsu. No, no, I don't think we're doing that. No, it's just it's so different. Yeah, they're good customers of mine. And those top guys in the world are really tough. They got cauliflower ear too. And I wouldn't want to tangle with half of those guys. But um, if you're going to have raise a kid through a sport, you might as well get his college paid for. Right? When you, you know, Gus went to the University of Virginia, you know, one of the best schools in the world. Um, he wrestled there. Um had some uh, injury issues, but, you know, I mean, he put my nephew out of the NCAA tournament. He beat Ian Miller at the NCAA tournament. I mean, he's undefeated against Ian Miller lifetime, right? He beat him in the uh, tournament of champion finals. Gus Seiko was, was a tough customer, but you know, your body, sometimes your body says no more. Right. But the experience there and the guy that Steve Garland is and the coaching staff that he was under, um, would you change anything about where, where Gus went to school and, and who you handed him off to? No, it was just unfortunate they got hurt, you know, and, and, it, and it happens. Gus, that was a good place for Gus to be. Garland's a great guy, you know, and um, that he did have a really good coaching staff. Jordan Lean, you know, it, I mean, that's good stuff. He was recruited by Scott Moore. Those are, those are all people I still talk to today. I mean, again, it was just unfortunate the way it happened. Um, my dream match, and it, it could have been a reality. It would have been Habit and – Gus in the NCAA finals. It just, Gus had a career ending injury and, and it does happen. They wrestled earlier in the year. Gus took have it down three times in the first period in that match. Um, and then things didn't go well with that injury and it's just the way it works. But that would have been a dream match. You know, two West Shore kids wrestling in the NCAA finals. That would have been the, you know. Wait a minute. Shore. Wait a minute. Was Dean Heil not a West Shore kid? Yeah, he didn't wrestle. He didn't wrestle another West Shore guy. He wrestled Georgie DiCamillo, who was not West Shore. Okay, so George was not West Shore. No, George Georgie was not. He was he okay. Was that's up. that's where I'm wrong. Okay, that was the Holy War though in the finals, and Saint Ed's won. Uh, I mean, that, that's pretty cool too. But yeah, I'm looking for West Shore versus West Shore. Um, you guys have never had that, you know, in an NCAA finals. I I I I, I could see it happening still. It could still absolutely happen. There's no question about it. We've had two national champions, uh, runner up. Well, Dean Heil won it twice. Habit took second. Lance took second. And then I think those are our highest. Those are our finalists. We've had multiple All-Americans over the years, but those are our highest finalists. Salzer was West Shore, right? No, Salzer was CYO. CYO, okay. Well, it's it's, uh, it's hard to discern who's what. Nick Namath was CYO, right? He was not West Shore. Um, The first really tough group of West shore kids that you could track through college were 
Mitch, DeJulius, Gus, yeah, Habit, yeah. um, yeah. JD, uh, man, there's so many of them. There were 17 kids, 17 kids on that team wrestled Division One at one time. Well, wish- you also got two brothers that were in your program that are worth a couple hundred million dollars each in the Paul brothers, right? <laughs> yeah, they, they were. Well, funny story about them is they were in our program when we were still at Westlake. We got kicked out of Westlake, and that's when Heffern and Son started wrestling and started to get competitive, and he pulled West Shore back to St. Ed's. Um, but we were at Westlake, and we got kicked out of there. The Paul brothers did not move with us. They stayed in Westlake. They were West Shore kids when we were at Westlake, and then when we moved, they didn't come. Um, they never started for us. They were they were in the room. Their dad bought Howard Ferguson's house. Oh, really? That's yeah. the house they lived in in Westlake? Yeah, they bought Howard Ferguson's house. And and uh, Mr. Paul brought all this St. Ed stuff and is trying to give it to me. Like, I don't want this stuff. I'm a Wellington kid. I don't, he probably had like tons of memorabilia that should have been kept. And I'm like, I, I don't want to get, get it out of here. It meant nothing to me, you know? So the Paul brothers, the, the early videos, if you look at the stuff they did in like in high school, like when they were being goofy on video and they would be in that neighborhood, it's like a cul-de-sac wherever they lived. Like, a, like a you know, a nice neighborhood, right? In Westlake. They would do goofy things, drag each other around behind like a four-wheeler and stuff. That was Howard Ferguson's house in those videos. Yeah, he bought he bought Howard Ferguson's house. That blows my mind. And then um, Logan was a state placer at uh, Abinator's weight. He took fifth. I'm not sure what he placed, but I know. You know, I got Beth. I'm telling you, I was reading it. When I was doing that last time I was there for your, uh, I was doing your guys' interviews, the chart behind, the chart behind you guys was actually Abinator, and he was fifth in that weight. Yeah, Dominic's tough. Dominic's running my EU club right now, and there's a good chance um, Dominic could take over West Shore. What do you think? Okay, so do you get to the point where you're like, I could it be someone who works at defense soap? Like, I mean, it's going to have to be someone who's almost, they own their own, own their own business. Right guy. Uh, well, Dominic basically does. He works for his father. Um, he coaches at Cleveland state right now. Um, and, and there's another kid out there, Schroeder, you know, Devin Schroeder. Yeah. Awesome I got, kid. I got these two guys. I mean, they're, they're unbelievably good. Um, and, and they're young and they want to coach and they want to learn. Um, I don't run the club for money, obviously. Um, but you know, there's, there's this guy named Sean Bormet up in Michigan. And I think you know who he is. Yes. He um he started one of the very first um clubs that were for profit, the overtime school of wrestling. Yeah. Naperville, um, Illinois. And he had reached out, he had a conversation with Dom and said, Dom, if you want to learn, need help starting a club, I'll help you. You know, I, I know how to do this. I'm like, well, that's great because I have a club ready to go that you could easily run it for profit if you need to. And and, and when I say run it for profit, I'm not talking like a thousand bucks a kid. I mean, you could charge probably 500 bucks a kid for a season, still be competitive and and, and get the job done. Um. And, you know, and Dom's, Dom's kind of down for that. Plus, I would still help him out there. There's there's a number of people that would help him out there. And, and I mentioned before, there's other St. Ed's people with money that will be coming back through with their kids. That would They're just good people. They're going to help when they're there. So it, he could be set up pretty good there. I have to I have to have West Shore run at least 10 years after I'm gone to make sure that Max has a good high school experience and, you know, it, it continues. Um, right now, again, I put these trophies up here as kind of a joke, but we're solid to the second grade. I mean, we're, we're solid through the second grade. And things happen. We could fall off and things could be tough. We're going to have a hard time winning junior high states next year, I think. But I said that this year. Um, but but we're solid, and I need it to be solid, you know, 10 years after I'm gone. When you, you talked about how um, you were with – Gus's mom and your daughter, who's a Coast Guard, um, was in the Coast Guard Academy. Um, what's the difference between her, uh, her and Gus? What's her name? I forget her name. Elise. Elise. So it's Gus, Elise, Max, and Emma. Did I get that right? Yep. Okay. So you've got these two sets of kids, right? And you, you've you said to me before, Gus was raised with a wooden spoon. Max, 
silver spoon, right? Yeah. Do you see a lot of similarities and differences between your two sets of kids? You got boy, girl, boy, girl, right? Yeah. Um, Emma's a princess. She just does her own thing. You know, she's like a, she does ballet. She does gymnastics. She's very much a girl. So that's, I'm not very good with little girls. So, you know, I kind of, I just, yeah. <laughs> Her mom's, thank God she's got a good mom. Um, Max, Max is a, he is a silver spoon. He, he got a chainsaw for Easter. He's not like, a, he's not like a spoiled kid. I mean, he got a, just a little electric chainsaw, but he got a chainsaw. He's back in the woods, cutting down trees, splits it up, makes firewood. I mean, that's what he does all day. He, he's that kind of kid. You give him a fishing pole, same as Gus, they'll go fishing all day. So there's some similarities there. Um, Max, I mean, he's very young, obviously, 10 years old, but he's doing the same thing his brother did, which is kind of scary. I mean, Max is knocking off some really tough kids, especially this year. I think this year he beat six kids that had beaten him last year. So a huge jump, young in all of his brackets, and he and he's doing he's doing a really good job. Um, Gus was no nonsense, no said grindstone, worked nonstop. Uh, Max a little more aloof. I think Max has maybe a little more natural talent, believe it or not. Um, but he's not the same grinder as as Gus was. Gus put 100% in every single practice, every single minute. Max, I got to nudge him along a little bit. He's always having fun. He enjoys it. But sometimes I don't think the intensity where it needs to be. And then come match day, he's just a different kid, and he just does a great job. How do the girls compare? Um. Well, my, my daughter is crazy smart. She works for the federal government. She was just working with the U.S. Navy on electrical system on the new aircraft carrier building. She's way up there. She's the highest female um, rank. Or I don't even know. They had that, you know, that federal government class, highest female in her position ever in the history of the United States, um, which is, you know, it's pretty good. She She's... She was one I worried about growing up, but she is laser focused on her career. She never calls. She bought a house in Maryland. She never calls me, never asked for anything. You know, if she calls me, I know it's going to be a nice conversation. It's not going to be, hey, dad, uh, you know, the world's falling apart. You know, so she's she's pretty phenomenal there. Uh, Emma, she's still very young. We're going to see what she does, like I said. And and I, part of it's me. I just want her to be a little princess. You know, I, I don't want her to have, I'm kind of selfish. I don't want her to be crazy competitive and things. I just want her to grow up being a little girl. Yeah. I, I think that sometimes we got to pump the brakes on it. Cause like some, some kids want to be grown up fast and that'll come right. That'll come in time. And I, I just, I want my kids to be young. Is she, is Emma seven? She's seven. Yeah. Yeah. Her and Ferdinand are the same age. We make our she, first commitment this week. So or next week. So she's all excited. She's first grade. Uh, second grade second grade so she's the great ahead of him but yeah they're so but they're the same she when does she turn eight may may okay so she's almost like she's, she's like nine months older than him but um looking at you know we talk about all these different clubs and what you guys have done and how much success you have you did this parallel you built this club well you took this club over that moved around a little bit went from west lake high school then you you know you have a home at uh saint edward now um but now you think about that, and then you did all this while you were a full-time police officer, and then you were building defense soap, right? Um, so busy in those days. Yeah, but it started out with, I love talking to people, like those guys, like you talk to a Sauls or you talk to a Dave Habit. They remember when you were handing out bars from the trunk of your car. Well, I used to give them to them. It was free. I didn't mean to start a business. I know I had this lady making soap for me in, in New England, and she was... It was a New England Moon Soap Company. And she was making these bars of soap for me. They didn't have boxes. They didn't have nothing. They just came in a big plastic bag. And I gave them to the kids because we all had ringworm. And I, I'm like, we need to find a way to get rid of ringworm, you know. So I did some research, came up with some ingredients. I had this lady put them in soap in it, and it worked. It stopped the ringworm for the most part. And then people were like, hey, can I get some of it? But I, I was a policeman. And I'm handing out $300 of soap at a practice, you know, it <laughs> didn't last long. So then I had to start charging. I charged what it cost me. And then I'm like, 
you know, I could probably start a business here. And I remember a friend of mine, Dave DeLorge. Uh, I don't know if you remember Dave DeLorge, his son, Brandon. Brandon, I remember him. Yeah. They were been, West, were they Westlake? They were West Shore and then they ended up at Avon. Avon, okay. He went to St. Ed's one year and then he went to Avon. Yeah. And Dave was always, he's a good friend of mine. He's always been a businessman and I always enjoyed, you know, I had no business experience, you know. And I remember Dave telling me, um, you you might sell $30,000 a year of this soap, you know, if you get it up and running and everything, you know, like $30,000. I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. It's so, if I showed them, you know, I just had an invoice go out today. It was 10 times that size, you know, and, and one invoice. It, it's kind of, it's kind of funny how he missed the mark on that one. I should say. <laughs> um, You know, I've talked to people about it and, you know, I don't, I have, I have, I let's look at me. This is a miracle product right here. This individual wipe, it came out of COVID, right? Because you couldn't get these, well, the round, the right. cylinder, right? So you had to switch to these. You couldn't, but you, you went to these because you couldn't get these, right? Is that right? We couldn't get the cloth. And the company that made those had cloth, so we had to go get the cloth there. We make our wipes here, but, yes. but those we can't make here because we don't have that those machines. And they just so happen to have cloth, so we we jumped on that. That you guys learned so much in that, and to watch you guys grind how you were grinding because I was in between the old, the screw factory, and then your move out to Vermilion, and it was like, dude, to watch it, to watch you guys pivot and work how you guys worked was like one of the craziest things I've ever seen. Like it was like awe inspiring. It was like a Herculean effort. It was all hands on deck, 14 hours a day, man. It was nuts to see when I, and I would just pop in for an hour or two. Right. We, we, well, first back on those wipes, we make 250,000 of those at a time now. I mean, the, the, the purchase orders for a quarter million units. It's, it's crazy on me. We go through those, but um, my, my crew here between Dan, Charlie and Gus, Brian Timar's, um, you know, Ethan's dad works here. Um, unbelievable crew. They moved from Lakewood to Vermilion. We did not miss one single order. We ship every single order the day we get it. So not only did we move a company into a 12,000 square foot building, we did not miss a single order. We had the shipping station set up here. So the second we shut down, we had enough inventory here for our shipper to start shipping here. We didn't miss a single order. Who runs the shipping? Leah. I have a I have a female lady that runs my shipping. She's been my shipper for a number of years. Um, we have a she has a helper now. She has an assistant um, that helps her ship. Um, and that, and that job beats people up. I mean that that job you could be pick up anything from a, a four ounce package to you know a seventy five pound box, and she's a hundred and fifteen pound woman. You know, so it's it, it's starting to starting to wear on her a little bit. So I have to find somebody sooner or later to replace her. But she's really good, you know. So it's it's hard to. Leah is, she's steady. She's steady every time I come in there. She's steady. She's always working. She doesn't get distracted. She's not talking. She's not walking around. She's she's boom 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 by the book. She's nice to my kids. She let Ferdinand help her do some bottles of some. Uh, some uh, uh, shower gel. Leah is one of the nicest, most genuine people I've ever met. Great hire and good luck. Good luck finding any type of replacement when she's ready to be done or move up. Yeah, she's a diesel. I call her a diesel because she just slow and steady, makes no mistakes and just goes. She reminds me of like the Terminator. <laughs> she just, everything in front of her, she's just, it's done. She just, she's on it. But you she's can't packing. If you, try awesome. her, if you try to rush her, you'll throw her out of her game. So I'm not trying gotta, to do that. Yeah, you just gotta let her go. And then if if she she's gonna get a certain amount of done, and if she can't, then you have to put somebody else out there with her. But she makes zero mistakes. None. She's amazing. Um, your wife Ashley, right? Her desk is right right across the office from yours. Um, what's it like working with your wife and your kids are all there and it's this total fan, it's a complete family business. What's that been like? Well, I mean, it's awesome. I, I would not want to be any place other than working with my wife and have my kids run around in here. Every now and then I got to shoo them out when I got to do something. But I mean, that's what life's about, right? 
life is about being with the ones that you love and and growing together as a family and um it's just the way we do things we i mean gus is still here i mean gus and i always bicker and i bicker with my wife but we're also running you know a multi-million dollar company with a global presence you know you're gonna bicker over things um but at the end of the day we're all friends that go home and, and it's a good time but you know I, I wouldn't want anybody else sitting next to me you know you had charlie you brought charlie over from like a like a i think he was doing gyms right like yeah. gym he was a cfo of a, a chain of gyms so you kind of transitioned him over right like he, he was still kind of doing that and you were kind of letting him do you were letting him split a little bit right yeah and then yep. then the gyms went under and then now he's full-time here at what point did you know you had a winner in charlie agazino i i always knew i did but i couldn't afford him you know how how do you afford a cornell graduate you know i, I have three guys that are fabulous i mean my whole crew is fabulous but the top three guys are dan gus and charlie and i really I really had to sweeten the pot to keep those kind type of guys around. I mean, those are talented guys. Gus, like you said, he went to one of the best schools in the country, and he's a warehouse and logistics manager here. Um, so we have to make it attractive for those guys to stay here. But Charlie was Charlie's a great guy. You know, everybody wants Charlie around. But you know, Cornell graduate, they don't come cheap. Nor should yeah. they. Well, yeah, they earned it. Um, but having a guy like that around, you know, he's so passionate about wrestling. He's coaching your youth program. And he's like, essentially, besides Gus, who moves the product and makes sure everything gets where you get things made. Those are your two. He's your right and your left hand, right? And then you got Dan, Leah, your wife. It's just like this perfect crew that you guys do. You know, Team R, you guys always got, it's always just like this productive, ultra productive group of people. And it's pleasant to be there. I love coming there. Yeah, we we just we just hired a new kid for the summer, um, and he's a good kid. He's a really smart kid, Ashton College student. Um, and we hired another. We have a, a special needs guy here that does a great job, and then and and he's great for morale because he, he's a good worker. But you know he has those little quirks about him. It's kind yeah. of funny. People take care of him, and then you feel good when you're taking care of him. Like Dan had, he doesn't drive, so someone has to pick him up. Someone has to take him home um he he's he's a valuable team member in a different way he builds you know he, he just everybody feels good when he's around um and then we 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 fired uh, dan's cousin um was tired of his old job and we hired him so we made quite a few and then um one of my youth parents mom she's leah's assistant shipping now so we we kind of make sure all the pieces fit we make sure people understand, hey, this is a wrestling company. When the NCAA is on, we're turning the TV on and we're watching the NCAAs. You know, when Max is wrestling in uh, wrestling in Tulsa, they all go in the um, conference room and they turn on Flow TV. We're a wrestling company. We're If you don't like wrestling and you're sick, don't come here. You know, that's what <laughs> we're going to do. You know? So, and, and, it, and now you have the gym in the back. You know, you know, I have the gym in the back. My guys use the gym in the back. They stay till eight o'clock at night working out or they come on Sunday and they work out. So it's, it's a culture that we build here and everybody fits in. Everybody wants to be a part of things. And it's just good. Um, you know, you talk about partnerships, you talk about flow wrestling, right? Uh, Chain Sparks does a great job, but um, you guys have partnered with them. They've done a couple of different pro uh, projects. They do moves of the week. You do all these different things brought to you by defensive. How has that partnership been for you through flow wrestling? And they're the, obviously the industry leader of the, the sport of wrestling and wrestling media in, in the world. Well, Charlie has a relationship with Shane. They have a call every Tuesday to go over things. So he's really tight with Shane. I just, I just oversee that when you deal with, um, when you deal with flow, you're dealing with the big boys. You got to open up your wallet. You're not getting away with, you know, five digit, commitments to them they're, they're big you know and you know it's a business but i could do business too if if i'm paying that much money you're delivering you know and you know they play they play a very hard stance but you know i'm, I'm a wrestler and a policeman for 25 years i could play a very hard stance back um and we understand each other i've had 
big blowouts with them in the past that I'll never work with them again. And then, you know, like you said, they're the only game in town anymore between with them absorbing track. You know, we were big in track and that's where we were Shane in track. And then he got absorbed back into flow. So I go, oh shit, now I got to go back into flow. And then, you know, you just over the years, you just learn how to deal with it. UWW, you guys were working with UWW. Um, what did that just expire with UWW? Uh, that was getting very expensive. And to be honest with you, they weren't really delivering um, the internet. The funny story behind the UWW is I went to them to um, get the approval from their medical commission. I think, I don't know if I tell you a story. I'm the only product of any type, vitamin, supplement, band-aid, headgear, brace. Defense soap is the only product that the UWW medical committee has endorsed in the world ever the only one so since they endorse us they tell usa wrestling you have to do this i went over usa wrestling to uww to get back at usa wrestling <laughs> i remember that i remember when that was all going down um you put some things on the back here there's things that you put on the back right it's on the it's on the uh on uh, bars of soap it's on no body wash it's on everything right it's on it's everything you guarantee your product right 100 people can can call you guys and and be like hey i got a rash hey well first off stop using it but you guarantee your product do you have to is, a, is there a lot of people that call you and want the hey we need my money back do you ever even get that and, and um 18 years, I've had four returns because it didn't work for them. Well, you just give them their money back? Just give them their money back. Four people. And um, I'm not sure why it didn't work for them. And some of them are a little different type people. Uh, but that's okay. I mean, I've sold, I don't know how many millions of bars of soap. I don't know how many millions of those little wipes. Um, but yeah, in four years, I mean, in 18 years of business, I've had four returns. Now I've had people say, like, um, you know, I don't like the smell or, you know, something like that. And that's just a matter of taste. There's nothing I can do about that. But I've actually had four people who said, this product did not work for me. I want my money back. I can tell you this. Ferdinand gets the eye black for his baseball team now. You know, the eye black for the glare or whatever it is. It's a gimmick, I think, but whatever. The only thing that will take it off, defense soap wipe. The wipes. The, the wipes. I'm telling you right now. I say it to you constantly. You constantly give me, you give me these constantly. This is what you constantly give me these. Yep. The 500 count boxes. And it's all I use. It's in every bag. I'm actually a fan of this over this. Um, this is awesome. It has its purpose. But for me personally, when I go out on hikes, these are utilitarian, man. They're for everything. You can wash your hands with them. You can obviously the business in the woods that you have to do when nature calls. These things have bailed me out of the grease in multiple national parks. In the parks around here, when my kids got to go to the bathroom and I don't have anything on me, these are in my pocket. I I can't give a more glowing recommendation. And then Mitch Clark, I was at a Mitch Clark camp this week, and he's like, "Oh my God, the wipes! They're most the most amazing thing ever." And I don't know if I sent it to you yet. He he put his address in a video. He's like, I will punch their product because I love it. It's amazing. Do you get that a lot, guy? Where people are just like, just give me the product. I want to push it. Um, yeah, we do. We just had another kid just do it. A jujitsu kid actually said that he wanted to do it just for product. You know, um, I have a big thing coming out with wipes, but I can't tell you because it's, well, I should, I should say we're starting um, conversations on a different type of a wipe that's, not going to affect anything about the wipes, but it's going to be pretty big in the industry that we're be again, the first one to ever do it. First one to ever think of it, but we have a, um, a pretty cool thing coming up with wipes that we're going to start talking about. I'm sure I'll get some information off camera. Yeah, it's cool. Um, will these continue? Yeah. We don't really get rid of anything. Um, you know, like, like our acne bar, I got a dump, I dumped, half of the PO of the acne bars because they expired. Um, but we'll bring the acne bar back. Uh, it's, it's just, um, 
I don't know how to explain it. It's a it's a foot in the acne market right yeah. now. It's slow moving, but we will grow it. It took me a year to sell my first ten thousand bars of defense soap. A, a year to sell ten thousand bars. Um, yeah, and I mean, I don't even know how many we sell. Thirty thousand a month now. It's wow. it's it's crazy compared to where we started. You know that acne bar. The acne bar is a little bit slow. Most companies would say that bar might not perform. We're going to pull it off the shelf and be done with it. We won't do that. We'll continue with it. And we'll get and another reason is I don't want all the phone calls when we do discontinue it. Like, where's the acne bar? I mean, I'll get a thousand of those. So I, I don't want, I don't want that pain, but we'll, we'll continue that acne bar until I could grow it into something huge. Um, my niece is like, she can't say enough about the acne bar. She is like cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs about the acne bar. She says it's the best product she's ever used for her face. It, it it's an educational curve that we have to get over. People don't think of using a bar of soap as an acne product. They think of Stridex. They think of yeah. a pad. You know, they 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 think of that. And that's another whole line that we could. There's two more products that we could develop over there. Like we could do a Stridex pad. We could develop a point. You know, put medicine on a pimple, but point cure they call them or whatever. Yeah. We could do that, but that's that's in another market. Not until that acne starts to grow. But that acne bar is good. It is so good for your yeah. back, your back, your shoulders. These young kids with these, you know, pimples on their back or their back of their arms, that bar clears all that up for them. Really nice. Now it's not like if you have like severe acne, it's not gonna, it's not, it's not gonna help with that. Yeah, you gotta go to a dermatologist for that. Yeah, it's for kids growing up with pimples. Yeah. Um yeah. You educate me on a lot of products, right? Like you educate me all the time, constantly about, um, you know, dandruff, for example, dandruff, you know, you were like, well, dandruff's actually a fungus. Seb. I never knew that. Yeah, 50%. Our, our shampoo bar is being processed right now. It's going through the FDA and everything. We have a medicated shampoo bar for beard dander, dandruff, keep ringworm out of the hair. So that's, that's one of the new products that's coming out. Will this change? Okay, so wipes, people don't know what wipes are. They don't know what, like, the actual physical makeup. It's paper, right? To wood a degree. Pulp, it's wood pulp blown onto a plastic screen. And I say plastic, I'm talking like um, like a spider web. It's meshy. Meshy, you can barely see it. You know, yeah. it's, like, it's like one hundredth the size of a, a fishing line. It's tiny. It's like a hair. Yeah. And then the wood pulp gets blown on there, and that's how they make it. So, you know, you, you, but you educated me on that. You're like, the reason that wipes are not flushable, but they're very durable is because they're a plastic, it's a, me a plastic mesh. I never yeah. knew that. And I don't think a lot of people know why wipes are not meant to be flushed. They are literally made of plastic. And like you said, the wood pulp, right? Yeah. Like 60% wood pulp and not even 60%, probably 90% wood pulp. And, you know, the mesh is very tiny. Yeah. Wow. I mean, I just, I learn so much every time I talk to you, even if, whether it's about skincare or, you know, antifungals, it's, and then, you know, when you talk about the product line, you know, I'm, I love the product line. You give me all the product, man. I mean, I always got this guy on me and this guy's full of, what do we got here? Oh, we got a whole bunch of these. I just, it's, it's, it's a utilitarian product. Your, your wipe is literally the most utilitarian thing I've ever seen. And it's convenient to have on you. You can carry it in your pockets. Um, I love obviously having, um, you know, this when I have this, the, the shower gel bottles, the travel bottle. It's, you, you know, it's like, it's just such a great line of products. It's easy. I don't feel like I'm pushing snake oil. Let's just put it that way. Well, the thing that pulled us out of the snake oil category is our medicated stuff. Yeah, the tulfinate, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then, yeah, the, Exactly. I mean, but that when you start registering stuff with the FDA and the FDA says, yeah, you're over counter medicine, people can't accuse you of snake oil anymore. And that was part of the reason why I I um created that antifungal bar. I didn't really care if I sold a single one of them. I just wanted to be able to talk about ringworm and, and prove to people that I could do it. I just chose not to. Um, but that was like a pretty good little thing that that uh, antifungal bar, I think, is number eight on Amazon right now of all antifungals. And three of our four of them in front of us are Lotrimin products. So we're like the third most popular brand on Amazon for antifungals. Um, Amazon finally stepped up and cut out all those 
um, pre-10 antifungal products, and they cut them all out. So when they cut them all out, we went straight straight to the top. Because you're a legit product, and those aren't. Yeah, that. So I mean, we passed the sniff test on Amazon. All the all the homeopathic products making medical claims, they got put in a different category. We're in the medicine category. But you guys, you know, forever for 15 years, right? You are holistic medicine essentially. Yeah. And and that's that's the really interesting part. Like I said, I just wanted to keep selling my original bar and have that. You can't talk about ringworm on your website or fungal infection on your website if you don't have a cure for it. You're not allowed to do that. That's what all other companies do. And the FDA started uh, they started to move the goalposts on what you could say and what you couldn't say. So it got to the point where I said, well, I'm either going to A, not talk about ringworm anymore and go out of business, or B, figure out a way to do this. So I created the very first ever antifungal bar of soap and registered with the FDA. That thing is just taken off to the moon. It's it's crazy what that thing has done. That's oh, yeah. what in front of the UWW. That's what is just puts me I love book. you know my favorite thing about you is when you circumvented USA wrestling. <laughs> I'm not even mad at you a little bit, guy. <laughs> I, I I mean they're not, I won't go, I'll tell you the stories off off record on that because I don't want to bash on them, but um yeah, they didn't do good things. Yeah, well, hey. You found a way. That's what I love about it. You got you're a junkyard dog guy. It's the best thing ever. Um, we always talk about Joe Rogan and these, you know, like th that guy doesn't want anything from you. You send him product, and Joe Rogan talks about you on the most popular podcast on the planet Earth. That's awesome. That talks. That's I think it's a testament to how you do business. Well, it's kind of neat. It was the other day he was talking about something and and he was in his home and on the counter was a bottle of Defense soap. So he's not bullshitting people. He uses it. I mean, it's yeah. on his countertops and everything in there. Um, Do you send him a pallet? Uh, no, we just send him tons of stuff. He, it goes to his house. I so, love it. Yeah, we send it to his house. He's a nice guy. People, I mean, I know a lot of people like him and everything, but he's honestly a really decent person. Yeah, genuine guy, nice guy. Yeah, I like that guy. Um, Doesn't have a care in the world. I don't think he has a care in the world, man. It's like, it's crazy. Uh, you coach the Paul brothers and your buddies with Joe Rogan. <laughs> and there's another guy out there. I don't know if you know who Eddie Bravo is. I know who Eddie Bravo is. 10th planet, right? Yeah, yeah. He's really, he's, well, he's friends with Joe Rogan. So uh, we have probably 15, 10th planet gyms that buy on a regular basis from us. At least it could be 25. I don't know. I'll keep I, track of the, the new choking out. Um, stickers that you guys had. How many of those did you print up and will you send those out to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and to, to grappling places? That's what they're for. As a matter of fact, we're sponsoring some women's jiu-jitsu tournament in Canada and we just sent some up to up to them. Um, I mean, we're, we're actually conscious about our marketing efforts. We're, we're wrestlers. Right? We, you know, we're wrestlers. Up until now, everything's been wrestling. Now we, after we show that, you know, that we have 10 versions of the sticker, we're going to do a jujitsu sticker. All right. So then we do the jujitsu sticker. Um, we were going to run a, we discussed running a female wrestling ad in Win magazine. Um, but we're going to, we're going to hold off on that for a couple months. So this Bud Light thing blows over, you know, we don't want people to think. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. I would wait. yeah that, that's pretty smart. So, I mean, we're just going to let that blow over. But in the works, we have a female um, wrestling ad to go into Win Magazine. I think they're going to make a female sticker for for wrestling. But we do things in priority. Our priority is wrestling, male wrestling. That is our priority. Then, you know, we move through um, our, our customer base. Jiu-Jitsu, very close to – I mean, they they spent a lot of money with us. Jiu-Jitsu is very loyal and – I have great customers in jujitsu, um, but we're wrestlers. So they're, they're second naturally because we're wrestlers, good group of people. And then, you know, then you have the, your women wrestling that you have to take care of. I don't think we're going to make a woman's soap. I get pressure to make a woman's soap, but it's just not what we do. You know, I'm not going to make something that I don't do. So uh, we just, we just have to figure that out. I think that's what we're talking about though. You stick to, what you are, you're unwavering. You're not, you're not a gimmick guy. You stick to your guns. 
you, we, we actually said, let's look at a woman's soap. Well, first thing, we have to change the smell of it. So we all sat down and they sent us all these different smells and everything. And I'm like, what are we doing, guys? This is not what we do. You know, we don't smell soaps to make sure people are going to like them. We make soaps that fight infection. You know, what are we doing here? So we kind of just like, if the women want to use our soap, you know, I almost think if you make something for women, you're patronizing them. You know, they want to be wrestlers. They want to be clean. They can use our soap. You know, they don't have to have a special soap for them. Then now you're patronizing them. Now you're putting them in a different category. You're saying they're different than you. So are you a wrestler? Do you want to stay clean? Do you want to prevent infections? Use our soap. And then that's just the stance we take. I love it, man. I think it's awesome. I think that what you guys do, um, you know, like I, I hate giving and doing other people's jobs for them, but you would think one of your partners would want to come and do a film on a wrestling business that supports them, that supports the sport, that gives back, that gives back to the athletes, that builds the athletes, has multiple very successful clubs. I'm going to run out of fingers here soon. But you would think that there would be a flow film on Defense Soap. No, I don't even think they realize what we do. They see us as business. They see us as a business partner. I don't know. I don't think even though I'm a wrestling coach, to be honest with you. Well, here's what I'm saying, though. I am the only media that really comes in and does anything with you guys. Is that, would you say that's a pretty true statement? Yeah, absolutely. But I, I think I feel it's just not, once again, that's not what I do. I don't do films. I don't, I don't go and bring shooters along and have boom mics and lighting. I don't do that. I'm just a guy with a phone who likes to do what he, you know what I mean? I just do what I do. I push a product. I believe in. I watch my son Thomas with your product every night. Ferdinand washes himself with your product every night and that's what we do. And you give me product. I talk about it. Um, I use it religiously and that's just what it is. I just figured they would be like, man, this guy's doing something special. Maybe, maybe we could, uh, a business that revolves around wrestling. Wow. That's something novel. They just did something. That's a wrestling only school. Mark Bader went there and I, I saw they had a shooters crew. So I don't know. That's just me though, you know, but I don't do that. That's not my, you know, I can't tell them what to do, but I think they're missing out on a gold mine of content. That's just me though, guy. Uh, well, you do what you do because you're good at what you do. So that, you know, you, you understand your lane and you stay in it. You do a good job with it. Um, them, I, you know, they're driven by the dollar. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's flow. They're, they're going to say what they're going to do. They're huge. Yeah. Uh, you know, but they do a nice job for they do a nice job for me when they're like like this Ohio State Buckeye thing. Young Bucks, yeah, yeah that's yeah. great, right? They did a great job with that, and they and they did a nice job tweeting it and getting it out there for people. So I mean, it, it took it took me several rounds with them before we got together on the same page. Let me just put it that way. Yeah. And now I value their partnership, and I enjoy their partnership, and I. And I don't want any of my competitors in that space. You know, yeah. I, I own that space. So I got to I got to say, same as the Big Ten Network. Big Ten Network, you know, I own that space too. So. so Mark Bader's fabulous. I think Mark Bader should be up at your place and they should be, there should be a week of shooting with the fun soap. But once again, I'm not the boss there. I'm not creative as they are. And I don't know what they know, I guess. Maybe, maybe you guys wouldn't move, move, move the needle for enough to, bring in subscribers or whatever, but man, I think it's a home run. Well, people don't realize the room that we have here. When I say I have a restaurant room back in my building, I just imagine that they think there's some mats down in between the racks back there or something. I don't think they actually realize the, the, the room that we have. Your room um, is bigger than Kent state and Cleveland states. Yeah. It's better. It's better than most college rooms. Yes. Um, well, now they got these super college rooms. I mean, the it's the crazy one. I mean, but the like Ohio States and the Michigans, we get that, right? Yeah. Your average Eastern Wrestling League school. You ever been to Edinburgh's room? Oh yeah, it's yours is bigger. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, I was claustrophobic in Edinburgh's room. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a real a, low ceiling. That's a gritty place, man. It's a gritty uh, place. Um, but it's just wild to think about. Okay, last thing I'm gonna have for you. We know that there is a four-year exit strategy and you're 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 you have candidates for West Shore. What's the exit strategy for Guy Seiko and Defense Soap? I have a pretty good one. Um, 
I, I'll be here five to 10 more years, or actually now four to nine more years. I, I have, uh, without going into too much detail, um, I'm, you know, I'm older than my wife. So there's a good possibility that I'm not going to be around and she's going to have life continued after me. So I have the business, part of the business, half of the business is going to go to a group of people that are going to run it when I die or I retire. My wife and I keep the other half, they keep their half. And then um, it's their job to run it and grow it and then pay me my half. So I, I, the reason why I did that is this company is too big for my wife to run. It's just too big. Too many moving parts. I mean, she's intelligent. She can run it, but it's just too much. Um, I would rather leave her half of something that I know is going to succeed than 100% of something that could fail. So when I'm when I'm done, if I die before then, you know, she's taken care of. If I retire, then we'll go do something together. But I have five to four to nine years left. Now it was five to ten. Now it's four to nine. And when I feel that these guys are ready 100% to just go then I'll go. You know, if it takes nine, it takes nine. If it takes four, then I'm out. So you will actually leave with you. So you, you make it to nine. Will she pick up and go wherever you go? Yeah. Half a mile down the road. So you'll just be right there anyway. Yeah, exactly. Well, I don't know if you're going to buy another house, you know, maybe a, a beach house or something. I don't know. You can do that. <laughs> well, my actual I, I'm not getting, yeah, I'm on the lake. I can't, I don't need any more water, right? I'm right there. But what I am going to do is, you know, you know, we're boaters, right? Yeah. And, and right now I'm looking, I'm looking between a 40 and a 50 foot carver. I have a, I have a 35 foot carver right now. I'm looking for a 40, 50 foot car, carver for the next few years to move into, get comfortable with that. And then when I um, retire, instead of buying a house in Florida, I'm buying a 57 foot carver pilot house i don't know if you've ever seen them um you could get into one for a uh, use one for half a million you know you're you could do it then i'm just going to take that south when it starts to get cold here take that south live on that boat that boat down there if my kids are wrestling or doing gymnastics in college i'll get on a plane go watch them compete go back to my boat stay on my boat from wrestling and come back up during the summer that's what i love, I, it. Like. I love it and listen i know it's going to happen <laughs> that's what I'm working for. I mean, that's what I would like to do. Um, this carver that I have now is my first big boat. And you had to actually learn how to drive a big boat, you know, compared to other boats. Um, and Gus owns the boat he grew up on. So I saw, I have those two boats side by side. Um, and, and then this, again, this is my first, there's, there's, that's a fly bridge with no bow thrusters, no nothing. You, that's pure throttle. The only way to steer that boat is with throttles. So that's, interesting so the next boat will have like bow thrusters and stuff so i could actually Jeez. yeah it, it's a big boat to drive with no bow thruster <laughs> you gotta learn how to do it right how do you even parallel park it how do you like it's hard it's back and forth right you get on you get on it and you try just hope you don't hit anything i think that boat weighs forty two thousand pounds if you oh hit God. something it's gonna it's gonna break it oh it's massive I love hearing boat talk. I've never heard boat talk out of you. I see boat pictures. I never hear any boat talk from you. Big boaters, um, and that's how I decompress. Um, wrestling season, West Shore, is seven days a week from November 1st till OAC. It's honestly seven days a week. If my junior high team is not competing, my middle school is competing. If they're not competing, my little guy is competing. If my little guys aren't competing, my beginners are competing. So it's seven days a week no matter what. Sometimes multiple events. Charlie goes this way. I go that way. I got dads over there. Um, and it's a lot. So when summertime comes, I go fishing. Good. I love um, hearing it. Um, listen, I didn't even think I was going to get an hour out of you. We flew past that and, uh, I love it. I love hearing what you got to say. If there's new things we talk about and, uh, it's awesome. Uh, do you got anything else for me guy? Well, I'll, I'll tell you about some new developments off camera because you know we have to protect these things right now um but i think you'll think it's kind of cool and uh no defend what you built right yeah and i always listen here's what's awesome whenever there's something that you guys want to break or something normally you give me first shot at it and um i appreciate that even though i'm not even the, i'm not in the news breaking business or being first i don't really care about that but i love it you guys do a great job with the product and um 
I will continue to use it whenever our, when and if our partnership ever ends, I will still be a loyal defense soap user. Yeah, you might have to talk to Charlie and Gus in nine years, but that's okay. <laughs> Four to nine years. <laughs> all right, I love it. Stick around, all right? Yeah, I'll be here. Thanks, Seb. Yep, thank you, guy.